close. Um, one thing that I think is really uh, fantastic is that in Japan, again, uh, you have upper class women, uh, pictures of them, uh, photographs and also woodblocks done in the traditional Japanese manner, of them wearing Western style clothing. But of course, they're wearing Japanese kimono silk, which is very bright, very colorful, things have flower patterns and beautiful, beautiful things. Um, and, and this is really sort of emblematic of the time. It was really this kind of thing. It can be experienced bright, really extremely colorful. Um, if you want to get a sense of, of the kind of color that the uh, Victorians wore, uh, you know, don't look at the photographs, don't look at the film, look at the paintings. Um, and the paintings are just a riot of color. Now, of course, that said, there is certainly a place for brown tones. Um, you know, they're, you know, tweeds are very good for traveling. Um, you know, brown, uh, Brown tends to be very good for, for working class individuals whose clothes make it very dirty. And as I said, uh, khaki, which was developed uh, in India for use on the uh, frontier, uh, is of course one of the first identifiable forms of camouflage. Uh, and then it is, after the Boer War, adopted by the British Army, who finally realized that marching around in red is a bad idea. Um, <laughs> it, it takes them a while, they finally realize it. Um, shortly thereafter, um, the Germans uh, adopt uh, a similar thing, they adopt, uh, adopt a uniform color for Feldgrau, which is sort of green gray. It's also very effective. Um, you have the, the Russians who uh, you know, are wearing uh, brown tones, uh, I think largely because it's a cheaper kind of uh, material, they don't have to dye it, but they're, they're using that. Um, really, it's the French uh, being the French, like they who sort of hang on um, to the, the uh, color in uniform uh, technique. And they do so uh, vehemently, sort of demonstrating that even after the military uses uh, of drab colors are demonstrated, you know, there are people coming out of the 19th century who are going to hang on to the bright colors. And so um, the French go into the First World War wearing uh, very sharp, very, very snazzy um, blue and red uniforms. It's very bright, they're very impressive. It's the same kind of uniforms that they wore during the Franco Prussian War of 1878 and 71. Um, and so they they march out of battle, and of course they're, they're done down horribly. Now everyone has done down horribly in that war, but it's a little bit easier to do, and actually the more vulnerable people snipers, um, which are used to launch a lot of during this war, um, when you're walking around wearing bright red and blue. Uh, and so they finally, oh no, it gets better, they finally catch on to the fact that maybe, just maybe, they should adopt a camouflage color like everyone else is doing. Um, and I believe it's in 1915, the second year of the war, and actually in 1916, um, they adopt uh, their, their brand new camouflage color, which is called horizon blue. And it's this bright, pale, powder blue. <laughs> Being the French. Um, it's, actually, 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 um, it, it's very similar to the, the shirt being wearing, actually, the stand up. Um, it's very similar to the color of the shirt that you are wearing. <laughs> which, and as I'm certain you can imagine, if you were in the sky, it would be fantastic. No one would see it. Uh, but of course, when you're in the trenches with the mud, it does tend to show up. So, uh, so that's kind of a, a little anecdote about the fact that um, you know they, people are hanging on to these bright, uh, you know, very sharp colors uh, as long as they can, even when it's demonstrated that there are more effective uh, techniques. So I'm going to open up to questions in just a moment.